Hey, YouTuberverse, Neil deGrasse Tyson here for Star Talk. Coming up, an exploration of our relationship with robots. Be there. This is Star Talk. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And today I got with me Chuck Knight. Hey, Chuck, hey Neil. Just bump that. Boom. Now we do this, and there's like someone between us here. I know. That's, I know. That's just we're rude. always fist bumping in somebody's face. <laughs> in somebody's face. Yeah. Uh, today we're talking about robots. In fact, that's not only what we're going to do, that's the title of the show. Talking about talking robots. Talking about robots. Talking about robots. A little and on the nose. We have as our studio guest, Kate Darling. Kate. Welcome. I don't get a fist bump. <laughs> Double fist bump. Give it a bang. Oh, Look at oh that. there you go. Mm. There you go. Wonder and and why are you here with it. us? You are a robot ethicist. Didn't even know that was a thing. We'll wow. get into that in a minute. From the MIT Media Lab, of course, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Where else would an MIT lab be? And what we're featuring today is my interview with Anthony Daniels. Anthony you know, Daniels. He, yeah. Oh, she's getting all all nerdy. She's nerding out on that one. Oh. Anthony Daniels, the actor who <gasps> portrayed C three PO. Oh, oh my god! Dear. Oh, oh, oh my oh, god! Oh, 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 <laughs> oh. oh, you want the gig? How lovely! Oh, R two, R two. Oh, you want the gig? No. Yeah. Um, in particular, we're not just talking about robots. Everybody we're talking about that. relationships. Oh, with robots. Okay. okay. Between humans and robots, and we don't even know what that means entirely, <laughs> not at the moment. Ah, uh, the movie AI kind of covered it. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right, all mm -hmm. right. But um, of course, C-3PO is from the Star Wars franchise, one of the most successful movie franchises In there ever was. Mm -hmm. And just let me get a little bit of background on you, Kate. So uh, did you come to this from robotics? No. No. Well, I've always loved robots, but I'm a social scientist. Nice. I have a legal background. I did social sciences, and now I study human-robot interaction from a social, legal, and ethical perspective. Wow. Wow. So this, so, so it is. It's good to learn that someone such as you exists mm -hmm. in that world. Yes. We should have somebody like you in all of the 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 potentially troubled places <laughs> where where technology is going. Right. You mean everywhere? <laughs> yeah, like everywhere. So you have a book that may be coming out in 2021. Yeah. I, I have a title here. Is this the right one? The New Breed. What our history with animals reveals about our future with machines. Ooh. That is a that is a awesome title. That really is. So so is this MIT Press going to publish this? No, it's it's actually Henry Holt. Henry Holt. Mm -hmm. So it's going to yeah. get out there. Um, let me go get to my first clip with Anthony Daniels, and we'll sort of react to that. So he's the only actor that was in all nine Star Wars movies. Wow! All nine of the official, not the right, not the 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 the, the fan off ramps. Right, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. all, he's the only actor that's been all, in all nine, and he's also the author of I Am C three PO, the inside story. Cool. You see what he did there? The inside yeah, story. Very clever. Yeah, right. Right, you see what exactly. he did there. Um, and what I particularly loved about him was that he's visiting professor at Carnegie Mellon Entertainment Technology Center. So mm. he's got some academic chops. Got a little cred, huh? Little street, little academic street cred. So cool. I'm loving me that. So what is it about C-3PO? Is it his performance, His the way he speaks, that that people could relate to him so deeply oh gosh c-3po is amazing i think i think what it is actually is that c-3po looks like a robot but acts kind of like a human like he's very flawed and has all of these human emotions and i think people just relate to him ironically because he's so human-like hmm. oh so oh so it's the opposite it's not like he's the perfect robot and we're finding a way to relate to that right it's that he's he has enough human in him so that he's an imperfect robot. Right. And that's what we're related to. Is that what you just told me? Yeah. yeah well, you know, that makes sense because that is what makes us human. They're like, you know, the fact that we are flawed and imperfect and, you and know. kind of annoying. And, and well, <laughs> definitely, not kind of, definitely <laughs> annoying, you know. So cause I kind of liked it when he when he got a little um, excited. Oh, 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 oh what, what, what shall we do? That was just kind of fun. It was like, hey, that's kind of cool. Yeah, exactly. You know? So so that's so it's the human side of the robot that we're relating to. Sometimes, yeah. In that case. Mm -hmm. In that case for sure. Okay. And so so then what would be harder then, do you think? 
uh, playing a, a robot as an actor or acting as a human? <laughs> well, I guess it depends. Well, like what robot? Like, are we talking a yeah, Roomba? Be, yeah, yeah. Oh, Roomba. Roomba. <laughs> <laughs> I just like that's a tough bump one. into some stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be kind of cool, though, actually, if you could play a Roomba well. You know, that, I think that would take some real acting chops. Well, let me, I, I mean, let me pose the question a little see. differently. So what is it about him, other than his costume, that told you he's a robot in how he's interacting with people? What is the evidence that he's a robot, other I than mean, he's a shiny metal thing? Right. <laughs> he's, right. I mean, a lot of it is the design. I'm trying to remember anything, like, specifically robotic that he said. See, I don't think so. Other than I know eighty trillion languages, right? Exactly. Yeah, something right. like that. Yeah, maybe. No, we know no human would. So that's a robot talent, right? But I think a lot is the visual and the way he moves. Yes, okay. well, and he does. It looks like he's actually doing the dance, the robot. They, yeah, of course. You know what you want to do if you want to be a contemporary robot though is fall over a lot. Oh, They're that's what all the YouTube good. videos. Yeah. Oh, you mean like actual robots? I thought you guys were just talking about movie robots because that's what, like, right now, movie robots. She works with actual robots. Uh, why, why, why would I bring her here to talk? What? Who do you think I'm talking to? Here? No, I know we're talking about that on the show. <laughs> I just thought that's what you were referencing right now because. Well, let's go to a clip. So I, okay. s I sat down with Anthony Daniels, and I, did you know he wasn't always a fan of sci fi? Really? Well, remember, he, he, he's Until an actor. Until he got that first check. <laughs> <laughs> love me. Oh, dear. I do believe I love me some sci-fi. Oh, R2, R2. Let's Where's the nearest bank? <laughs> <laughs> Let's find out. <laughs> what, what was he up to before he landed where he did? Check it out. Maybe I'd been traumatized. You know, I never thought of this. I had been bashed around the head by 2001 A Space Odyssey yeah. to the point where I never wanted to see another spaceship. Or Cause a, that was a long movie a with long very movie. little dialogue. Yeah. There's no character development except for the how, yes. the computer. Well, you're right there. So it's a very different genre. intersection of genre. Yeah it's, yeah, it's not even science fiction. It's some yeah. other, it's a science portrait in a way. It was almost Teacher a portrait. philosophical treatise on on man and and, and man versus space. Yeah, man, machine, and space. Yeah, yes. And uh, so there we are. So I didn't want to go because back then the only robot that I remembered really were the Daleks on television. Oh, the Daleks! Yeah, yeah so so yeah. Of, of Doctor Who. Exterminate, you know. Yeah, Doctor uh, Who. Doctor Who with sink plungers on, the, on their <laughs> faces. I mean, cute, and as a kid, I adored them. But as an acting role, not so much. Then there was Robbie before them, Robbie the robot in, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Forbidden Planet. Forbidden Planet. Yes. And he was this kind of lumbering thing made of Michelin tires, really, it seemed to me. Yeah, because he had these horizontal segments to That's him. right, and he yes. lumbered in a mm -hmm. kind of unprepossessing way, I felt. But anyway... Are you judging the acting talents of a robot? <laughs> no, but it, it was... Uh, you it, just gave a critique. No, no, no. It's a, no he lumbered. It, he didn't it, pull it is, off that lumbered. movement convincingly. He lumbered. And when you read on page 95 that I met Mr. Kinoshita, who designed him, and I said joyfully, oh, what was it like to see your design come off the paper? And he went, oh, not so good. I didn't mean him to kind of lumber. And I said, so, oh, so you get why 3PO kind of teeters around because it's more characterful, more forgiving, more more human in a way. Yeah, yeah. because because the uh, Robbie the robot was um, I, I'm going to say robotic. No, I don't know. He he just didn't. There was no. He had the arms. That was it. Yeah. Whereas C three PO, there were sort of body gestures that could help yeah. communicate. Th that's right. A, a mood. And it's all I had, really. Right, because there's no. This is not a moving mouth here. And you'd be surprised how many people think it's makeup that I'm, uh, I'm wearing. No, it's a solid... Well, we all saw Goldfinger, so oh, just a couple of years uh, earlier. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She was prettier than me. <laughs> 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 Who's the she? Oh, the woman... The woman who was painted in, gold in, in Goldfinger. In, in, in Goldfinger. So he was referencing his book, I Am C-3PO, and he said on page 95. Right. So, so Kate, how has... We, we talked about a few generations of robots there. How has our concept of robot evolved from the beginning until now? That's a good question. I mean, I feel like it used to be that anything that was even remotely automata and could move on its own was viewed as a robot. And now we have a little bit more that we expect a robot to be able to do in behavior. Right. Because, in fact, now, so when, do, when does it become an android versus so it, a robot? An android is a robot that looks, looks deceptively human-like. 
Lieutenant so Commander Data. Yes, yes, Data, my favorite android. And then there's C-3PO, which is more of a humanoid robot. So like, oh, head, has torso. I forgot the word humanoid right. goes yeah. in here. Yeah. Yeah, so androids look realistic. Humanoids just have a kind of human shape, torso, head, arms, legs. So not R2-D2. Not R2-D2. So what's R2-D2? He's just a robot. Just a robot. Man, with no oid on it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Poor R2. You're just a robot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, but presumably all three kinds of robots are still legit in storytelling today. Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. But we don't have the big Robbie the Robot kinds anymore. Those, the lumbering. Right. With, with its circuits turning in, the, in his... Warning, Will jowls. Robinson. Warning. <laughs> right, that was a Robbie Robot style. Exactly. In, That's a, in, in Lost in Space. Lost in Space. Warning, Will Robinson. Danger. That's not warning. Danger, Will Robinson. And, but That's, arms and with the arms would be flailing. Right, right, and then right. Dr. Smith would be like, oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> It's before her time. I, are you talking I about never these saw shows? this movie. That's what I'm you, are you kidding me? <laughs> you don't have TV land? Well, I feel like I just saw it, though. You really did, in a way, you know, but I did Because he no acted justice. all the characters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did it no justice, but very, very quickly, here it is. In wait, wait, wait. Where did you grow up? Where, oh, yeah, where'd, where'd you, you grow up? up? In Switzerland. Oh, oh that's oh. why you never saw it. We have American movies in Switzerland. No, no, Not but the it's a good TV ones. show. We only sing you to crap. The TV show. Yeah, it is a TV show. Oh, see, I don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, they are. You got to get out more. They're thank traveling. You, they're you. traveling um, intergalactically, right? And or may, maybe just within our galaxy. Who knows? But they get lost, and it's a family. You know where they get lost? They get lost in space. They get lost <laughs> in space. <laughs> and um, and then there's a uh, doctor who who we're not sure if he's a doctor or not. And they let him go off with their son all the time and a robot. And that's where that comes from. So, at what point do you inform? A person who might be trying to des design a robot Ooh. in terms of its personality or its character or how they would best be an actor doing so. Or do, do you are you in that equation at some point? Well, are you a consultant? I mean, I do. I work with roboticists a lot uh, in social robotics, and um, the, it you know we have more and more robots coming into shared spaces, and they have to you know interact with people, and not all roboticists. Wait, wait, what's, have, what's a shared space? Oh, you know, a workplace, household, public area. Oh, okay, like okay. Stop and shop as robots roaming the right. aisles now. Do they? Eyes on them. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you could call. They are indeed a robot, but it's more like an obelisk on wheels with googly eyes. It attached. looks like a penis. Wow. What? All right. Good. <laughs> it does, though. I mean, well, I'm just saying, maybe to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it goes up and down the aisles. Yeah. And there's no one controlling it. No one's controlling there's it. There's no joystick. It actually moves about like a Roomba. Like, you know, except it doesn't have to touch things. It and I assume the... it doesn't bump into the orange. It does. Aisle. It does. Okay, bump the, into the... the orange stack, right. But I think I've never engaged with them personally, but I think you can ask them questions and they will direct you to places in the store. All right, I got it. Uh, the next time I see one, I'm doing all kinds of experiments on it. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was going to say. I'm, I might have gone to Stop and Shop last weekend with. Daniela, who's one of the students in the personal robotics lab, who is obsessed with this robot, and we might have like put stuff in front of the robot to see what it did. You might just might. And have. what happened? Yeah. Well, they might have done it. They didn't. They. Oh, you might. They, if, they you had, might have. if you had, what do you think would have <laughs> happened if you had actually had. done it? If you had done it, if we had. What, what do you think might have happened? What were you testing it for? We didn't get kicked out mm -hmm. okay. yet. We're gonna go back. What, what were you testing it for? What? Well, we just wanted to see what it would do because the purpose of the robot is to find hazards on the floor and alert someone to come pick them up. And so we wanted to know what's Clean the hazard. Clean up aisle four. Mm -hmm. Clean up yes. aisle four. Right. Yep. And and so right on. Now, what would, I wonder what it would do if you just laid down in the floor, like on the floor in front of it. Like what it would do if it's actually, if that's. It'll a, go around you. See, that's a really that's good bad to robot. No, a why? What are you talking robot? about? So you'll recognize a spill, but I just had a damn heart attack. <laughs> and you'll just go around <laughs> And you'll go around me? <laughs> really? It's, it's, so somebody drops a jar of pickles and it's a huge <laughs> monumental problem. We need, you know, somebody to get here right away. But you're falling and you but, can't get up in the but, robot. You're just in the way. Exactly. <laughs> Instead of hitting my, my med alert bracelet, you're just like, okay, excuse me. Like, really? So that's the thing, though. Like, when designing robots, you have to think about how, like what's going to be frustrating to people when they're interacting with it and they're going to be like why isn't it helping me do x when they don't understand that building a robot is really really hard 
And like they only have very limited capabilities. And so roboticists really need to think not just about how they're working, but how people are going to perceive them. They only have limited capabilities now. Right. Yeah. Stop covering so, for him. <laughs> so Anthony Daniels. <laughs> yes. As an actor. Mm -hmm. Okay. He, uh, you know, he's best known for C-3PO, but he almost didn't take the gig. Oh. Yeah. So let's find out why. Okay. Check it out. So there, there we were playing, uh, thinking about playing a robot, and the thing that really changed my mind was reading the words that I had not written. George and his team had written them, pretty much George, and clearly he he had invented a machine with more human characteristics than he could apply to a human being. You couldn't get away with Han Solo being the character of three PO, if right. you see what I mean. Right, right, right. So three PO is allowed to have intense humanity because he isn't a machine he isn't a human. he isn't human yeah. that's 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 deep not really the, <laughs> yes it is no, because it what you're saying is with a machine who is sort of human but it's still a machine yeah you can take it to human places that would be unconvincing if written for a human character and slightly uncomfortable Wow. Written for it. There are. Um, I never thought about that. Yeah, that's, well, you will good. now. You will Thank now. you. In your next lecture, you, you can talk <laughs> this up. There is an, a film called Bicentennial Man with. Uh, no, I never got to see that. Ah, it's interesting. Um, Robin uh, Williams. Williams, beautiful guy. I, I had luck to meet him a couple of times. No, we didn't talk about it, but that was a slightly uncomfortable film because the the storyteller was was he was transitioning from. A robot that arrived in a packing case, you know, from Amazon or somewhere, and and back then, then. And back <laughs> whatever then. the Amazon equivalent was back when that movie was made, yes. and and then gradually he, he metamorphoses into uh, into a human, and it's slightly uncomfortable because it veers towards uh, pushing our humanity buttons. Like, what what does it take to be human, and where are we slightly uncomfortable through the uncanny valley and beyond? When so tell us about the uncanny valley because that's well, that's it's it's a great name, but it still has to be defined for people to know what it is. It, it is um, often used in, in games or in uh, visuals or in, in film to, or in computer terms. Um, the, the Turing test almost gets there, but um, it, it's when something is almost real, it looks great and it speaks nicely and has great skin, for instance, in a robot, but there's something that's not quite right. There's something that we sniff as a human being that not quite there. So it's it's even unconscious within us, perhaps. It's innate within us. Innate, that's a better word. Right, right. You're not you you don't even know how to verbalize it. Verbalize it, it yeah. And th so people have coined this phrase the uncanny valley because you know there's something not quite right. Mm -hmm. Kate, do all humans respond to the uncanny valley the same way? So people have tested this theory empirically with very mixed results, but most people who work in robotics seem to think that there's something there. And they're wrong. They're um, wrong? Yeah, they are. Let me save them a lot of money. You're wrong. <laughs> save and all the academics who have researched this. Save all the academics who are researching this forever. You're okay. wrong. What you're talking about is the perception of normal humanity. That's why you can't put your finger on it, because it doesn't exist. We feel the same way about human beings that may have some type of brain disorder. And we talk to them and we go, ooh, something not quite right here. Mm -hmm. But you don't say they're not a human being, but that's really what your, uh, that's what your perceptions are telling you. So what you're talking about is the normal perception of humanity as opposed to uh, what makes someone human. And they're two yeah. different things. I think you're right. I think I personally. I, I know think I'm right, Kate. Oh, oh. Uh, let me tell you something. Oh. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. So that comedy ahead. thing doesn't work out. We'll, <laughs> we'll hire you in the lab. All right. But go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, the Uncanny Valley has always been about expectation management because you're expecting something to behave a certain way. If it looks human, you're expecting it to blink like a human and not twitch its face. And if it doesn't, that kind of unsettles you if it if it does something that you're not expecting. No, but the little things that we don't we're not even conscious of that affirm for us or our sub affirm to our subconscious, you're, you're that, communicating right. with a genuine human being. Right. Yeah. Right? But see, you know what's funny is that I fell for it once over the phone and it was a robot. And I talked to it for about I don't know, 15 seconds, which is a long time. Okay, when you're so we're learning that you have issues. I do. <laughs> Clearly, I can't figure out who's human or not. But it was just, I don't know what it was that tipped me 
but it was like the the cadence, you know what I mean? The cadence of the, I started to speak and that stopped, but it's the way it stopped. And then I went, is this person real? <laughs> and then it clicked off, like it hung up. Wow. Busted. Well, I, so so what, do you, what do programmers yourself, what do you all do in the media lab to either exploit the Uncanny Valley or to dodge it? I don't think anyone wants to exploit it, but I also don't understand why we would try to create something that looks like a human or talks like a human because we can create anything we want. Why create, like, why try to, like, risk this uncanny valley creepiness factor when we can create an R2-D2 that communicates in beeps Do and you boom. tell this to your peeps back at MIT? Oh, yeah. Like, everyone, I think, in the social robotics field agrees that making, you know, human-like robots is not as interesting as making something that has it ca something has better expression has yeah you can make something, something better better than humans animators have honed this technique for hundreds of years how you can make something like bambi that looks like a deer but actually looks better than a deer to us okay all right so i i i agree with you but from a different direction so i i think the future of ai and robots is not to try to mimic a person okay a person is not even an ideal form no right right there if for tasks that you want to conduct the human body is like why you why would you design that right. that's just not the case even, even with the the um the people who don't have legs but they run track on the blades on blades yeah <clears throat> we're not trying to duplicate the bones of a foot and right. then put flesh on it and say right. now you're no it's like we got something better Here's something better something better here's something that'll spring and so, propel you forward yeah, faster so, so in your in your lab are are people thinking of the task they need, not trying to duplicate a human? Because we can just, people make babies all the time. Why do you need to make a robot human? We have he real humans. Well, right. I think people have like this fascination with recreating ourselves, but like I, I really don't see the point. I think we're all in agreement wow. here. Wow, right. yeah. Okay. I mean, I've never thought of it that way, but you're right. I think, you know, when you look, look at sci-fi movies, like uh, Alien comes to mind, and the... the uh, so-called android robot is so human that it's indistinguishable. Indistinguishable, but the problem is, it doesn't have a soul, so it can't make any more. Mm. It, it's a sociopath. Let's get to that next. Okay. Okay. Because so she's a robot ethicist, and that's like right. There. Oh, that's that's <laughs> the sweet spot. Huh? <laughs> that, that, okay. That's in her uncanny valley. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> we got to take a break when Star Talk returns more about the evolving relationship Ooh. between robots and humans. We'll see you then. But we're back. Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson, your host, Chuck Nice. That's right. Kate Darling. Kate Darling. Da Kate Darling. Kate uh, Darling. In from Boston. Thanks for uh, from Cambridge specifically, the MIT Media Lab. Good stuff happens. Every time something amazing is happening, it's traceable back to the MIT lab. It's funny how that works. Just, just, uh, just, not only like art science and robotics science and computing and stuff. So, just and 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 culture. Yeah. So, just congratulations to all y'all. Oh yeah, it's just me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you, you're the one. All right. Credit. Uh, just, I, I just want to pick up on where we left off. This idea that. Um, it, you're talking about in the Alien series, there right. was a human, Bishop. Th there was a human who was not human. Right. So not even humanoid, uh, android. Android. An android. Yeah. And you're cool until you realize they would make a different ethical choice than yeah. you would. Yeah. Yeah. I so, 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 how, do, do you have to program this in? Is it something they can learn? There's a whole field called machine ethics that looks at can you program ethics into machines, and it turns out that's really really hard because we don't even fully understand. We haven't or programmed agree on ethics humans. into us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't program something that you ain't got yourself. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I would prefer maybe not to create robots that have to make those kinds of ethical decisions. Uh -huh. But there are people who are who are trying to solve that problem. Okay, and so but it would also be a way. If some, oh, so let's get back to the concept of soul. Right. And a religious person would say the soul gives you a sense of right and wrong right. and purpose. Purpose, and, yeah, right. and, and these sorts of things. And, would that, and that was like the idea with Bishop. Bishop didn't have a soul, so if it meant that bringing back this life form to Earth that could potentially wipe out all humans, 
it doesn't make a difference because it's, it's an in the interest. Experiment. Right, it's in the interest of experimentation and yeah. exploration. So who cares? I think this is people's greatest fear about scientists gone astray. Yes. Yeah. Without so, a doubt. So it, will that be the hardest thing to program into robots? A soul. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, that's three lines of code. Right. I think that's all. <laughs> well, Japanese people actually people believe that certain be. things have souls. D tell me about yeah. the Japanese. What's yeah. So, like, the, there's this Japanese roboticist who creates these very, very lifelike androids. Like, he's made one of himself. Hiroshi Ishiguro is his name. And Ishiguro. Ishiguro. And and like it. It seems that in you know, Eastern cultures that have a history of Shintoism and, and believe that, you know, even objects can have a soul, like they have funerals for sewing needles, for example. It seems that they're what? more- What? Yeah. Yeah. That must have been a badass sewing needle. <laughs> if you were to give it a funeral, there. that must have sewn some good stuff. Uh, <laughs> would have darned a lot of socks. Poor yeah, Needy, we knew him that. well. <laughs> <laughs> needy, is that- the... Needy, that's what we called him. <laughs> That's your, needy that's, the needle. That's your nickname. Yes, for the exactly. Needle. Mm -hmm. So, so tell me, I, I, I was unfamiliar with this. So keep going. Yeah, and and we don't have that concept in in more Judeo Christian society. We have oh, things are alive and have a soul. Things are not alive don't have a soul. And so there's this not idea. Not only humans have soul. Or that only humans. Right, yeah, right. depending mm -hmm. on you know yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, that's why some people say that the Japanese are much more accepting of robots and this idea of having right. humanoid and android robots around because are they're they, like, hey, that's cool. Are they also more accepting of robots in the Uncanny Valley? Uh, they might be. Again, like I said, the empirical testing on the Uncanny Valley has kind of been mixed, so there's okay. not a good scientific basis for mm -hmm. it. But anecdotally, yes. But see, and, and part of their... But is it part of the fact that in their culture they have a greater need for robots. I mean, it is clear that they have, like in Japanese healthcare, uh, they don't have enough people, and you have a, a, a great advancement of robotics in that particular arena. Well, isn't it, are you yes. confusing robotics with automation? No, I'm talking about actual robot care. I mean, and different, like for instance, in a hospital, like for um, the delivery of certain things. Okay. A robot will do that rather you know, than rather a than orderly, or uh, orderly mm -hmm. right? You know, so uh, for instance, or just just even go outside of healthcare um, hotels that you go to where they have robot check in, and it'll be like a Tyrannosaurus Rex will check you into the hotel. <laughs> really? Yeah, okay. you know, a robotic a robotic Tyrannosaurus <laughs> because that's, just fun. that's right. yeah, yeah, because mm -hmm. it's a novelty. That's how much into robots they are that we are not. You know, so so that's so that's and what about Shintoism? enables that or empowers it or well, drives it. Some people would say that that makes them more willing to accept robots as this sort of thing that's alive but not really alive. Oh, oh, so the, the simple element of inanimate objects having souls, that alone that, would be sufficient. So that is one reason people think the Japanese are more accepting of robots. Another reason is, like you said, the need. As robots come more into these shared spaces and people interact with them more, people just get used to them. And then there's also the fact that their science fiction and pop culture tends to be less dystopian when it comes to robots. Like, they have Astro Boy. They have these positive stories. I grew up with Astro Boy. Astro Boy bombs away <laughs> on his mission today. Rocket high to the sky. Well, okay. How come I don't remember that? Because I just made it up. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> that was the actual song. That I was the actual song. I remember song. Astro Boy. Yeah. yeah all the, and there was, uh, well, they also had Speed Racer. Speed. There was a lot of sort of early anime. That was the early Japanese anime. Yeah. That, that made it to American television. That's right. And yeah, it was all very, very happy stories. Yeah. And, but we have a lot of Terminator and you know, stories of the robots taking over. Oh, they have less of that. That is true. Man, we are so I, messed up here. I never thought. But see, that's what happens when somebody drops mm -hmm. a nuclear bomb on you. <laughs> You know, oh, oh, Japan. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Think about it. You have a whole other outlook. Like, your dystopian future involves, like, nuclear holocaust. Right. Everything else is just, like, happy go lucky Wait, fun. <laughs> although, okay, Japan did come up with Godzilla. All right. And now, although Godzilla was formed out of genetic mutations from, from nuclear, a nuclear holocaust. From nuclear holocaust. Ah. See, there you go. Okay. Full circle. Yeah, the nukes are all in yeah. the, the storytelling. That's it. Yeah. It, it makes sense. Yeah. So, so, our. Are the, is the Japanese culture a good bellwether for the global acceptance and trajectory of robots? That's a good question. Um, not I would say not necessarily. I think that maybe the ways that they will want to use robots are different. 
Okay. Like the fact that they like androids, and I don't really think that we do in Western society. Right on. Yeah. But it'll be interesting to see if all countries have equal access to this technology, what they'll come what up they'll with relative do. to their own cultural needs. Right. And For sure. Because we had on Star Talk on the TV show, and I forget her name, but she is an AI representation of a female. She's still making around. She was on evening Sophia? talk shows recently. Sophia. Sophia. Yeah. Oh, I hate Sophia. <laughs> <laughs> she speaks so highly of you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know she why. She follows me on Twitter. <laughs> 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 yeah, Sophia was a little, was for me in that in that zone. She was zoning out on the, she was un, in the uncanny zone for me. Yeah, yeah. Le- yes, exactly. It's a little, it's a little disconcerting. It's there's something jarring about it. It's I'm, called the uncanny valley. <laughs> we, you're like we already explained. This we to already you, explained Chuck. that, dude. <laughs> um, so Anthony Daniels, we're featuring my clips with him. Uh, he has an interesting perspective on. Uh, what makes C-3PO more human than a robot? Ooh. Just his perspective. Because he he was, he is C-3PO. Cool. So, so let's check it out. And George came came up with this idea of uh, this kind of figure, this Art Deco figure. Uh, then he uh, employed Ralph McQuarrie, who made this life-changing painting that I saw of the character. And then Liz Moore, the sculptor, turned that into 3D and made this beautiful face that people recognize. And interesting, I only just realized the other day because I was trying to cheat in Photoshop. Because some, 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 some robot faces are just scary. And yeah. this is actually very, it's, it's, got, it's got curiosity in it, yeah. and it's, but it's, you, you want to know what he's thinking. Because so, he clearly is thinking, yeah. and partly it's that sort of wide-eyed, uh, almost babyish stare with 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 big eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, and what was interesting, Liz had actually, and I never realized it until recently, created something that wasn't machine perfect, it wasn't uh, symmetrical about a center point. It is actually as in a human face. I tried to flip it in Photoshop to double it up to make it perfect, and it doesn't work it because doesn't work. he is asymmetric, and that is a, is a one of the clues, I think, to his humanity. That's an interesting philosophical point because there's been research on symmetry Mm -hmm. and there's a whole off-ramp from that research that says, maybe it's not an off-ramp, maybe it's an on-ramp, that a little bit of asymmetry brings interest to a character, to an image, to a painting, to art. Perfection, there's nothing more to say. It's like uh, somebody did it already. Right, right, right. Now, just between you and me, you do have a very symmetric face. Let me just just stare into uh, the camera I, here. I personally don't. If you if you L- cut me in face. half, if you cut right, me here, 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 here we go. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here we go. Okay, there Look you go. At that. Okay. It is not symmetric. Yeah, you are so um, symmetric. Just, um, just would I like? You are yeah, perfect. I'd, I'd probably like to be, but it's too late now. I think. Uh, yeah, we have to, have to go with what we've got. <laughs> Were you hitting on C three PO? No, I was just saying. <laughs> his book had a picture of him and uh, uh, and right. the robot, and so I put the other half of him next to his head, nice. and it, it was him. I'm just saying. But what a so. genius design uh, tactic to actually purposely put in asymmetry. Tell me about perfection. I mean, I hadn't heard about this asymmetry thing before. That's really interesting. Mm. But uh, one of the tricks that a lot of robot designers use in social robotics is to, you know, if you're going to give it a face, don't make it as human-like as possible and don't give it too many features. Like, don't necessarily give it eyebrows or a nose. Just eyes is enough. Things that we automatically respond to, like he was saying, like the big eyes, the babyish face, things that we kind of evolutionarily respond to are the best the best design tricks. Oh, okay. Hmm. That's right, because um, babies, their head grows only by a factor of three, and the body grows by a factor of five or six. So babies have a disproportionately large head right. to their body. Yeah, I push one out of me. Tell me about oh, it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you should have just built it in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you had, you had the power. You have the power. You don't have to do. You don't have to do it. You don't have to biologically recreate. Okay. <laughs> the rest of us, we do that right. if we could. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I think that the argument from evolutionary biology standpoint, at least what I learned from my colleagues here at the American Museum of Natural History, here's a commercial, is that in order to prevent mammals from killing their children, 
the children have to look cute. Yeah. And so the not not that everyone would kill their children, but I'm just saying. I would. Yeah, most most would. <laughs> no, yeah, no, there, it's not that you would want to kill them all the time. There are occasions right. in the arc of raising children where you, if they weren't cute, that they would we go we go extinct a long time ago. Uh, have you done research into what the what our relationship with robots says about us? Ooh. Psych- psychologically, a bit. emotionally? A little bit. Uh, I could talk about this all day, but it's kind of like, you know how when you go on a date with someone and they're really mean to the waiter and you're like, that's a red flag? Some of our research indicates that if, you know, you're mean or violent to a lifelike robot, that might say something about you as a person. Oh. Wow. You know, that makes sense. It's um, So the Boston Dynamics has these videos online of robots being abused and I know f- f- clearly you that feel that's it. I, that's a thing that's not a person and I got to tell you it is so hard to watch right. cuz they're hitting it with bats and they're mm. kicking it and they're knocking right. it over this is a robot that's trying to walk yes it's, it's trying, trying to walk yeah, and yeah. basically I've, I've they I've seen those you seen those yeah, yeah. And, and 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 it's really disturbing it's yeah, like people get really upset yeah. like the first time that they put one out that looked kind of like a dog and they named it Spot and then they're like kicking it and it's like struggling to stay on its feet People got so upset that PETA, the animal rights organization, was getting a bunch of phone calls and had to issue a press statement. And they didn't even take it seriously. They were like, yeah, we're not going to lose any sleep over this. It's not a real dog. But there actually might be something there. Okay. Okay, so would you preemptively, I mean, is this like, is this like, what's that movie? Uh, uh, With Tom Cruise? Yeah, yeah, The Minority Report. Report. Is this how you would pre-diagnose someone's (laughs) propensity to... Well, I, you sort of already said so, because in a date, someone behaves in a way that is uh, right to, to, to someone who they have power over. Right. I mean, it's tough. Right now, robots are still really primitive, and mm-hmm. we're still able to like mentally compartmentalize. But as the design gets more and more lifelike, I mean, we do definitely draw connections between animal abuse and child abuse in the same household legally. If you have a case of one, you look for a case of the other. Oh, and hmm. it's possible that... Strong correlations already yeah. established. Okay, all right. And if you have a robot that can like mimic pain and suffering and you enjoy inflicting that on it, like that might be an indicator that you might also enjoy torturing an animal. But we don't know. We don't have the evidence... This this requires more research. All right, well, so it's certainly evidence that you're a dick. That's for sure. <laughs> I feel like he kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting. So in the dating scene, these are like secondary cues. To, they can be really nice to you, but the waiter not so much. If Make, they kick the Roomba, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> See what you do is you got you, what you have. You got to do the research on your date. If you know your date's into robots, you, you better be on your best behavior with all the robots in your life. Exactly, right. Right, right. right. That's going to be the case. Um, given the examples of the Boston Dynamics and people kicking it, and you feel the emotion mm-hmm. for something that is not alive, right? where do laws ultimately have to land with regard to rights for robots? Well, it depends. So I believe in evidence-based policy. So we really need... yes, I, I actually I do. <laughs> What's uh, wrong with you? I'm like most legislators. <laughs> I, uh, Have you been yeah. checked out? Have you? <laughs> I know, I know, okay. but like really, like it would be nice to have some evidence. Right. And if, if for example, we found out that it was actually desensitizing to people to behave really violently towards life like robots, mm-hmm. then, you know, there's some question of whether we should regulate and say you're not allowed to do certain things to certain types of robots. Because Ooh, it's fostering I, behavior that would be counter yes, to the interest of civilization. So, so to me, only if it actually has an impact on that behavior. Actually, I, I, I have to say that makes a lot of that sense. That would be evidence-based legislation. That's evidence-based. That makes a lot of sense. Very, very hopeful there. Yeah. But it's tough to research. Yeah. Okay, so you you can imagine a future where that's the case. Oh, yeah. Okay. Have you watched Westworld, that TV show? Yeah, yeah. I mean... Great show. Yeah, it's it's pretty good, but like you could imagine if we had a theme park like that, people would get upset. Right, right. However, well, I'm not going to get into right. Westworld. So, so actually, my my last clip of this segment, uh-huh. uh, I talked to Anthony Daniels about uh, robots today. Hmm. 
just just to get a sense of what is because you know that character dates from the seventies, right. right? So just what were his thinking about the interaction of humans and robots today? Let's check that. And one of the frustrations we have now with with machines that pretend to be human, and and certainly in Japan there are um, companies working on human. Oh, do I leading the way on that? Every time I see a new robot, it's a Japanese robot. Yeah, well. They like that kind of thing. They, they've slightly taken it to their own in the sense of social um, interactions with, with machines, mm-hmm. uh, human to machine, human cyborg relations. Indeed, George was there first. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, some of them, uh, we're in early stages of real r- robotics, and we have to think what we want from that. But when you have something that p- pretends to be human and then um, sort of suddenly malfunctions uh, it, it's like well we're talking about stepford wives yeah, yeah. suddenly i'm i'm alerting to all these the, the, the thing about the you've film given industry, us a full review of 20th century robots here this is great well, this is yeah. great and okay. and uh, 20th century film writers script writers who now very i think cogently have adopted this slightly outer world nether world where we are going not in my lifetime i hope because i i need the work you know <laughs> So let's not move. I'll come. Actually, I'll come back to that. And of course, in in Japan, it's it's widely known that they are looking for really human relatable, probably you know bed bed sized uh, machines that people can relate to. But then you have to look at how you what kind of figure physically do you supply? Right. Because if it's too humanoid and it starts clicking and then you're, it's a little scary, isn't it? Right, right. Uh, if it's too mechanical, then you're relating to, I don't know, um, in a, a can of um, fizzy drink. It's like, <laughs> where's the balance between who I want to believe I'm relating to? Because if I get too fond of you and you're a machine, it's not going to end happily. <laughs> there are all kinds of off-ramps there for where that would go. Let's not go there. <laughs> yeah, so what, is there any thinking in your lab about human robot relationships bonding yes. bonding yes um and where does that land well for me and a lot of my colleagues i feel like we're yeah, as humans capable of a lot of different types of relationships mm. and to me the relationship with a robot isn't necessarily the replacement of a human relationship it's more like how we would treat a pet or it's something completely different and new um so it's not something that's that enlightened I worry about. though but maybe not. But th- I think that's an enlightened outlook. I, it's not clear to me that that's where that's going to go. I think people, you know, pe- if if people can have imaginary friends, then they can have a robot that that becomes a friend. That becomes a friend. Okay, but why is that bad? No, no. I'm asking you. Is yeah. there, is there sub? Should we? I I, I, I I don't mean to imply it's inherently bad. I'm asking you. Have you guys thought about whether or not it's well, the, what I what keeps me up at night isn't that's what we want to know. Isn't that someone might bond or have like a friend as a robot? It's that a company is making that robot and maybe is using the robot to emotionally m- manipulate that person. But that already happens in, yes. in toys. No, um, no, it's called advertising. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's even we manipulate it all the time. It yeah, doesn't even take a robot. Doesn't even take a robot. You're absolutely right. Big psych- psychological brain screw <laughs> called advertising. Yeah. But no, I remember. Um, the uh, it was like a furry or a Furby or something, but it's a little robot and it's like and it says things like I love you and you're my <laughs> friend and it's like you know I, like I was like I would never get that for my kid like that's the loneliest kid in the world that needs this toy that's like giving it love and affection and and reinforcement. There was an episode of The Twilight Zone where there's a guy isolated on a on a asteroid somewhere. This early before they knew how. Right. What space was really going to be. But anyway, he's on an asteroid. And this asteroid apparently has a breathable atmosphere. But <laughs> holding that aside, holding aside these compli- these, the holding that aside. Right. Okay. Exactly. Um, they, he couldn't be rescued for like a long time and he's slightly going crazy. So they brought him a robot, a female robot. Okay. And you, it says, turn here. And then she. Comes to life. She comes to life. Of course, it's played by an actual actress, but right. it doesn't matter. She's a robot, and then it's they they they're companions, and they're there for like a year, and then the rescue mission finally comes, but there's no room on the ship 
For her? No. For her. No. Wow. Oh, no, this was a deep story. Oh, I love oh, it. Oh, my God. Oh, do tell what they happens. They said either nobody gets back or we're going back without your companion. He says, no, but she's, she's, she's this. They I love her. Guy takes out his gun, shoots her in the head. What? And then the springs come out and the thing, and it said, let's go. Who who does that? The, it's the, in the show. The guy in love with her, or, or what? Is no, the other, guy? No, other guy. No, the other guy who's trying to save his 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 oh. fellow astronaut. That was so cool. Shoot, oh. to, to remind him that she's, that, that she's just not, a robot. She's just a robot. So so what? Whoa. Talk to me. Okay, but yeah, I mean, robots can fill a void like that. They're already being used as an animal therapy replacement in nursing homes because we can't use real animals, and so you bring in this baby seal robot that gives you the sense of nurturing something. And people become very attached to them. Wow. No, so I'm asking about yeah, the well, ethics of the story I just shared with you. Oh, well, I, I mean, I, I think it's unethical to shoot the lady robot. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, but they, otherwise... That psychologically they, damaging. For otherwise, them. they all die because there's only one seat on that rescue well, ship. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. That's the construct. Yes. Right. And you're an ethicist. Talk to me, woman. Talk to me. Why couldn't she sit on the outside? She doesn't breathe air. Oh, good point. Yeah. They could have strapped her up. Strapped, <laughs> strapped, 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 strapped her to the bottom of the ship. Sure, I forgot about Yeah. That. You know. Thank you. Now we don't have to resolve the ethical issue. All right. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. Chuck solved that problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, t but tell me, how would you, where... Can, I, I, can, I just, it be, I, can it be unhealthy, though, this this bonding that you're talking about? It can be, be, yeah. I mean, if it's being used to manipulate someone or if they're bonding with something. So it sounds like she was meant to be a tool and they didn't anticipate that he would bond with her this much. Yes. And this happens in the real world. This happens with soldiers bonding with the, their bomb disposal robots where oh. they treat them like pets and they get really upset if they get broken. Particularly if they save your life a dozen right. times. Yeah. Exactly. Right, yeah. So Peter Singer has written about soldiers actually Peter Singer, risking the, their lives. the um, Princeton philosopher. No, so there Singer? are two Peter Singers. Peter Singer, there's a Peter Singer who um, has written a book called Wired for War okay. about military robots. Ooh. Oh. Okay. And they're, apparently soldiers have risked their lives to save the robots that they See, work with. they're actually missing the point of that robot. <laughs> yeah, well, or... Yeah. The, point the robot is to save their lives. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. But it's kind of, you bond with something if it saves your life, though. And I don't think the people who deployed that really anticipated that response. Real interesting. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So, so here's the question, then, if you're going to make it empirical. There's the risk to his psychological health having no companion for a year versus the risk to his psychological health of well, having a companion of that you put a bullet through her head. Right. Which of those is worse? I mean, not having a background in psychology, my guess would be... It's, Ethically. I mean, either. you know, we get pets and we know they're going to die and this is a similar thing. Mm -hmm. Like That's true. You get a dog, they ain't going to be around in 20 have, years. Yeah, That's we right. have to deal with death. We'll take a break when we come back more of the relationship between humans and robots on Star Talk. We're back, Star Talk. We're exploring the relationship between robots and humans. Yes. Featuring my interview with Anthony Daniels, who recently published the book I Am C3PO. Ooh. Yeah. And we have with us as sort of an expert commentator, Kate Darling. Kate, reintroducing you to those who Whoever comes in only in the third segment, I don't know right. who that is. No. Animals, anymore. that's who. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, thanks for bringing your, your MIT lab perspectives for us. So one of, my, one of the aspects of Anthony Daniels that enchanted me is that he has an academic affiliation. Hmm. Let's check it out. Okay. Um, I, maybe I shouldn't call you Anthony Daniels. I should call you Professor Daniels. This is I'm I know I'm, I'm uh, fundamentally an academic, yeah, so I well, my, my my radar I, I, I perks know. up. Yeah, well, you you can call me a professor, but I know where you're going because I'm not a professor. I am a kind of visiting mm, uh, professional at Carnegie Mellon University. Carnegie Mellon, one of the leading institutions in yeah. computer science yeah. and robotics yeah. and everything you know automated. Yeah, yeah. but I uh, years ago I I kind of got connected with it, curious circumstances, through the Robot Hall of Fame. 
Oh. They invited me. It's an institu- institution in the Science Museum there mm-hmm. in Pittsburgh. They contacted me. Would I come and accept an award for C-3PO to be part of their exhibit? Yes, of course. Oh, how could you not? And traveling. And I thought, yeah. You now, know. I don't mean to brag. Uh, here we <clears> go. <throat> I don't mean to brag, but I'm in the Bronx Hall of Fame, just so you know. So don't See, get too big-headed, because I'm in the Bronx Hall uh, of Fame. Okay, and they understand your accent. That's so <laughs> cool, 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 cool. But on the way there... So where, uh, is, the, where is the Hall of Fame? It's uh, in the center of, um, of Pittsburgh. It's in the Science Museum. Oh, very and good. And, for instance, you know, they've got, uh, they've got C-3PO, they've got R2-D2. They've got a uh, baseball machine that can pot a ball every time. Get that hoop every time. Big arm. A, a basketball. A basketball. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, it can do it mechanically every time perfectly. They've no matter got, where you put it in the... Uh, or just from that one spot. I think you... Yeah, it's cheating, isn't it? Yeah, you, yeah. You're, it's rubbish, isn't it? I know. Uh, I know. And they've got the, the, one of the original arms of that original... Um, to, could pick up an egg and put it there and just do that all the time. Oh. They've also got... Oh, so they have the history they've of They've got this the exercise. history. Of the, and at the time, that would have been quite remarkable to get well, a machine the, to do anything. It was the first... It was the first... Uh, what was the um, industrial robot there was. There it is. Uh, it was a and it's got to be able to pick up an egg and not break it. Not break it, but also put it exactly to replica. And, the, you know, the definition of a robot has changed now from the early Asmovian days uh, to where we are, a, a machine that can do something kind of that's useful, just doesn't need a human to do it. Mm-hmm. They also have, for instance, a, a room as large as this, which is a uh, medicine dispensary, which is apparently far, far more accurate than having a human dispenser mm. in a hospital. It's mm. dishing out the drugs, but in, in a good way. <laughs> so, guys, what's if you visited that Hall of Fame, let's assume they have all robots, what, what would be your favorite robot, Kate? My favorite robot? They only have real ones, right? Like, not science fiction. Well, no, C-3PO is in there. Yeah, he's... Is Wally there? I like Wally. 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 Yeah. Wally. Okay. That you're allowed, even, if they, if, you, even yeah. if they just have a drawing of Wally, right. we'll give you Wally. You like well, that's cute. I like that. Okay, yeah. how about you? Uh, Alien Covenant, which wasn't the best movie in the world, but Michael Fassbender. Oh yeah, hot pla- robot. Hot robot. <laughs> 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 uh, but not as hot as um, what's his face in AI. He was the male sex robot. I forget. Oh his yeah, name. he's gorgeous. Um, um, God, did I just go gay for robots? I think I did. <laughs> totally did. I totally, totally did. did. Anyway, Michael Fassbender plays two robots. He plays himself. He plays Walter, who has no emotions, but then he plays Walter's evil twin, who does. And they're both robots. And they're both robots, but the one without emotions, believe it or not, easily manipulated by the one who has emotions, because when you're evil, you can do evil. But when you don't have any emotions, and you and you and there's You're not, susceptible. You're just susceptible to anything. Wait, so that's your favorite robot? Yeah. Yeah. Which, which one? The, the evil one. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I can't lie. The evil one is my favorite. Damn. Yeah. Chuck. You know why? Because I don't have it in me to be that, and I think in some, I think maybe if I did, it, I would feel differently. Or maybe you need it to complete you. Ooh, wouldn't that be cool? So at what point do, do you think about the good and evil that a robot might or might not do, either because they're programmed to or because they learn it mm. on their own? Right. Yeah, I don't think we think about it in terms of inherent good or evil, but more how is the technology being used? By those who should know the difference between good and evil. Yes. Right. But see, I, humans. But, but see, now apparently at some point, these machines will be programmed by algorithms hit, written by people, even if they're written by other machines, written at some point by people, and good and evil will be kind of inherent in that algorithm. Yeah, it's going to be a whole mess of gray. And <laughs> well, okay. Thanks. And thank, you, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you for those hopeful, yes. <laughs> those hopeful words. I'm very, very hopeful, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, I had to take the conversation r- there. Okay. The future of AI infused in robots. Let's see what Anthony Daniel says. I, I am a little frightened by AI, and you're quite right. I come in to deal with the talks of the students with an objective eye that I, I, I don't know any, I don't really understand much of the science, um, but I have a, a, an outer perspective, and, and gradually through practice, you know, I'm enjoying uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, all these sort of things that are gradually bringing the theatrical user, if you will, the entertainment user, 
into the scene. So you're not just a, a sit back participant, you, you are actually involved. So maybe the, the gradualism of this yeah. prevents anyone from even noticing the day that AI takes over. I think kind of that's already happening. <laughs> but in the world of entertainment, which is what the Entertainment Technology Center is about, yeah. um, the, the, the growth in, in involving entertainment, um, is is re very marked, you know, with with all these headsets coming onto the leap motion and all that kind yeah. of thing. But in a world where robots are going to uh, industrialize jobs and take jobs away from human beings, which they've already begun doing, yeah, yes. we'd better look to what humans are going to do apart from twiddle their thumbs. Mm -hmm. Well, wow. mm. yeah, interesting. So let me let me ask you now then. Uh, whatever you were not thinking about evil in the moment, how about evil in the future? How about AI turning evil? How about, have, have, let me ask you a tighter question. Has AI, as portrayed in film, gone the right places that we all should be thinking about? Or no. are they missing something? Yes, they're missing a ton. And I love science fiction. I think that science fiction opens people's minds to thinking about what's possible. Mm -hmm. But we have so many dystopian stories of robots taking over that people are fearing robot uprisings. When that's very premature and we should be worried about other things that are happening right now. But you didn't say Hollywood that it wouldn't happen. It. You just said it's premature. Well. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> People worry about robot uprising? Right. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> For at least another two years. Right. <laughs> Not yet. That's so 2027. <laughs> <laughs> no, so tell me. So what? where should we be focused? Well, there are a lot of issues right now with privacy, data security, supplement versus replacement of human ability with, uh, you know, reinforcing racial gender stereotypes in the design of these technologies. Like all of this is happening right now. Right. There's autonomous weapon systems being developed. There's things we should be concerned about that aren't the robots becoming smart and taking over the world. I think that that one also tends to be a lot of rich white dudes worry about that one because mm -hmm. they don't have to worry about the other stuff. They're just like, my oh. only danger is that a, a robot, robot is going to kill me. Right. Oh. That's it. I don't have to worry about like facial recognition holding me That's up at the airport. That's sociologically insightful. True. You're right. Yeah. That makes a right. lot of sense. That's plus, plus, you've seen the, um, the, the racial uh, sinks in bathrooms. The, yeah. The, 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 the racist sinks. No. I don't know about this. Yeah, you know about those? No. They can't see black hands. Yeah. And we've done this with all types of technology because it's all white dudes building right. it. Right. And so, right. Yeah, I just thought it was the sink didn't work. I, you, you put your hands on it waiting for the water because it's an automatic that has sink. has happened to me. And nothing's oh, Maybe that sink doesn't uh -huh. work. So then I go to another sink. Then I wave my hand some more. And eventually, uh, you know, it, it'll hit. Right. But if I, So if you do the experiment, you put in a darker surface or a lighter surface, it's 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 reflecting. It's about reflection of yeah, light. Reflecting, reflecting the light. Right. right. So what you're saying is, um, white men, say it, white men. White men, men, because there's also a lot of gender stuff that right, happens. Right, yeah. right. Uh, we'll design things thinking that they are the model of what it is and should be and, and capturing their concerns. Yeah. But it's also not their fault. Like we all view the world through our own experiences. And so the problem is that we don't have diverse teams building technology. Right. That's really where it is. Yeah. It is their fault if they're not hiring you. Or Chuck. That's Chuck. Right. They need to hire Chuck, really. There you go. <laughs> Can a Chuck. black man have clean hands? <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to stave off viral infections. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, you're hired. We'll put you in. <laughs> but we don't want any trouble. <laughs> no, but you raise a very important point. If, if what, I'm stereotyping here, but if white men are programming all of the code that will be the future of AI, it could have remarkable, remarkably biased consequences. As, as an unintended consequence, yeah. right. You're speaking about this as though this is in the future, but this is actually happening right now. Well, gotcha, listen. Yeah, I know, that's why my hands are dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck ain't clean his hands and he don't know when. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Thank God for hand sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how about this? Let's let's uh, try to land this plane. Okay. What do, you, what do you think is our largest ethical dilemma going forward? I think the thing I worry about the most is that a lot of AI, the way it's built right now, relies on data collection. They need massive amounts of data. And so I worry about privacy because there's no incentive to curb that right now. Interesting. Well, because if you want to know all about humans, you want got to know 
everything what they ev do. Everything they do. But then other people will also have access to that data. Governments right. will, companies will, and that's it's already happening in China, right. yeah. where they're collecting uh, information uh, privately, but then the government forces them to turn over turn that information, over, yeah. Yeah. Yep. including facial recognition that happens on just the streets of of, 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 of the cities, where right. they're like, yeah, all that camera data. Yeah, how, how, how do I identify foreign nationals? Exactly, so give round, it here. round them up. Right, right, exactly. So yeah, that's. And so how do we lean into? Because I do think there are so many positive use cases for this tech. So how do we lean into those positive use cases and curb some of this stuff? That's no, that's no. The don't challenge. ask us that question. I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring you here to if, ask that. No. If I had an answer, then my no. job would be you know, over. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, hmm. Uh, let's get some parting thoughts, Chuck. Yeah. What's your parting thought here? Uh, you know, I'm 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 really uh, I'm really disturbed by the fact that there are racist things, man. I'm <laughs> sorry, that, I Chuck? did not know about that at all. <laughs> and this has happened to me. It's like I feel violated by sinks now. That's all I can think about. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry to take you off off the rails yeah. there, Chuck. <laughs> So, Kate, give me give us something hopeful here, reflecting on it all. Okay, I'll give you something hopeful. So, mm -hmm. you know how people are sometimes nice to robots and then they feel silly about it? Yeah. Like, they'll say excuse me to their robot vacuum cleaner. Right. Or they'll, like, say please or thank you to Alexa, the Amazon's assistant. I don't think people need to feel silly about that because I think that what that is saying is that their first instinct is to be kind to another. And right. so what I really, really love about robots is that they are kind of a reflection of our own humanity in a way. I mean, our interactions with the robots. Yeah, our yeah. interactions with them. Oh. That's cool. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So if you're a good person, a robot will tease that out of you. Good, yeah. But if you're a bad person... The robot will do the now same. Now you're bringing it somewhere dark again. I know. Yeah, We're Chuck, supposed man. to end on something positive. Chuck, right, now, right. Chuck. Robots are good. She unless, tried. Unless this sinks. Unless. <laughs> unless <laughs> racist sinks. bitches. No. <laughs> Chuck, you saw she was trying. I know. She's I trying. Know. Let, let help. I give. Let give the woman some help here. Okay. 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 All right. So it can be give us insight into humanity. Yes, into our own empathy and psychology and how we relate to others. So we can learn more about ourselves from interacting with robots. Okay. Cool. Because I don't think that's been explored much in storytelling. No, it hasn't. Right. Actually, right. You, you, that is a very good like platform to mm -hmm. use as a jumping off point for like. I mean, it has been explored, but it's not what everyone's thinking about or talking about. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So uh, here's what I think. N not that you ask, but I'm we don't care. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Says the media lab professional. Why don't you treat? Why don't you treat him like a robot? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> this is the real side of who we got here. Um, I think, and I don't even know if I have foundation to think this way. I think the apocalyptic scenarios are overplayed. I think we always, we always deal into our base lowest fears because mm -hmm. fear tends to always override our joys that's natural i think for, for survival right you can you know if you're not afraid of something and it kills you then, then you're dead gone <laughs> is the gene to be afraid of stuff that will kill you right? right so right. you're taken out of the gene pool so i think it's been overplayed my worry is that our distraction with the evil prevents us from thinking more creatively about the good. Hmm. The yeah. good that robotic AI can bring to this world. And I don't I don't want to lose out on the creative solutions that they can bring. So uh, so, Kate, I put it entirely on your shoulders yeah. <laughs> to fix the problem because this office is not called the Media Lab. Right? <laughs> this is just Neil's office. Right. All right. Or the we're Cosmic Crib. We're going to send you back home back to your back to your peeps and we want you to solve this problem challenge accepted excellent chuck always a pleasure good to have you kate thanks for coming down from boston thank you so much for having all me. right and and now that we know you're up there we'll, we'll surely yeah. do this again absolutely we will totally take him to another place yeah because that your kind of expertise doesn't just walk up and down the street all right. the time <laughs> so we're digging this <laughs> anyhow you've been watching possibly listening to this episode of star talk Robots and Humans. 
And I just want to thank Kate and Chuck for doing the show. Absolutely. As always, I bid you to keep looking up. <laughs>